construction. It was just one of those moments where you're like, okay, 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 it's coming. We gotta go, we gotta go. Watch out, Josh! It's scary stuff. It is scary stuff, okay. Everyone get in! Shut the door! Shut the door! See, we're all just trying to ride out this storm. We made a we made a ceiling with a mattress. And welcome to Weather Geeks. I'm Dr. Marshall Shepard from the University of Georgia, and I think we have a first today on Weather Geeks. We've had tornado chasers, but we now have our first hurricane chaser. Josh Morgerman is a world-renowned hurricane chaser. You've been in 25 eye walls. Wow. Um, first of all, just tell me, how do you how do you get into this? How, where in the world do you get into this? I think uh, you know. I, I, I basically think it's a mental illness that you're born with, just, uh, you know, just this obsession. You know, I, th I remember uh, as a small child just, just being very excited by violent weather, and I didn't know why. And I grew up on Long Island, so the kind of violent weather that I knew was hurricanes. And then as I became an adult, you know, I had the means to just, just go after them just because of this, this thirst and this hunger to be inside them and see it. Now, speaking of extreme weather, you were recently in the strongest hurricane recorded in the Western Hemisphere, Hurricane Patricia. You chase that hurricane. What made you go down to Mexico? Or were you in Mexico, first of all? Where'd you go? Yeah, um, you know, when I went, when I flew from LA to chase it, it was actually a tropical storm and I expected it was just gonna be a run of the mill Cat 2 hurricane. Uh, I like chasing on the coast of Mexico, so I was just kind of, you know, just wasn't expecting anything epic. And then it became, you know, as you know, the strongest hurricane yeah. ever in the Western Hemisphere. And I have to say it was, uh, you know, I'm a pretty hardcore aggressive chaser. I go for it, you know, and I'm, I'm into st powerful storms, you know, deep in the tropics. This one got so intense, you know, when the winds went up to 200 miles an hour and it smashed all records and it was going to come ashore on this stretch of the coast with, with small towns without a lot of strong buildings. I started to get a sick feeling right. in my stomach. The side of me wanted to get in the car and just head for the hills. Yeah, and that, you know, when you're in that situation, you know, we, you know, you do it for the reasons you do it, but then you start to see, wow, this thing is not like anything we've seen here in Mexico. This was a record storm. Now, you know, specifically, where were you for the, the bulk of the, the chase? So, well, it's interesting, the, um, the chase, the, the, um, this hurricane, uh, besides being very intense, the inner core was very small. Right. And as it came ashore, it really was one of the most wobbly tracks I've ever seen. That core was wobbling. Now, as a chaser, you want to get in that core because that's where the most extreme winds are. That's where mm -hmm. you're going to get the really low air pressure data. So my chase partner, Eric Sereno, and I were just driving up and down the coast trying to sort of go with the wobbles. Mm -hmm. And the, the dangerous part about that is that we finally picked our, our, our location, Emiliano Zapata, a small town, just an hour before damaging winds uh, started coming on the coast. So we like, we really pushed it down to the wire. So that town, it's a very small town that's about halfway between two big population centers that got lucky, Manzanillo and Puerto Vallarta. Now, it got pretty hairy for you at one point. You had to take cover in a bathroom with a family there. I mean, tell us about that. I yeah. think we may even have some video of some of this, too. Yeah, it got out of control. Um, you know, this, this hurricane, um, it, it, like I said, it had a very small, intense core. And so basically, the, the violent winds didn't last long, but they packed one heck of a punch. Uh, when we got in that inner core, uh, everything just turned white. You couldn't see anything because of the rain and the wind and the whole building started trembling and then it started to blow apart. Wow. So my chase partner and I, we got into, we retreated into our hotel room. Two hotel workers who were freaked out joined us. Yeah, well, here we go, some of the video. And then all of a sudden, um, the, the roof of the building blew off and the people across the hall from us, the family, were just in a room without a roof. And right. so we, uh, Eric actually went and got them, helped them into our room and then we all were in our room and then the building started to come apart some more. And so we all pressed into our tiny bathroom eight people. Wow. Now, that story right there just triggers something that I've got to bring up. I mean, after the storm, people were saying, oh, it was an overblown storm. The meteorologist hyped it. I wrote something in Forbes just completely dismissing that. You're sitting there telling me that you're in a building with a roof off? I mean, tell us about your experiences, how that is far from being an overhyped storm. This is a, a storm like we've not seen before. So just paint a picture for our viewers to kind of dispel this myth that one of the strongest hurricanes we've ever seen, possibly the strongest, is overhyped. How can you overhype that? Yeah, th those, those, um, those 
those reports frustrated me, and I was happy about what you wrote. I, I agreed with it wholeheartedly. Um, it seems like there's a general misconception among the population that, that hurricane intensity is a function of how many people it affects. Right. And so if it doesn't affect people, well, then it must not have been strong, which is crazy. Right. It was an inc a monstrously intense hurricane that, that moved ashore, fortunately, in an area with just some small towns, and it missed major population centers. Right. It was ferocious. And if you ask people in Emiliano Zapata or those little towns that were in the inner core, exactly. they were calling it Categoria Cinco Plus, yes. five plus, yes. because to them, they just it was nuclear. And to me, it was. As a right. chaser, I've been in, like, as you said, 25, the cores of 25 hurricanes, and I was just like, I, th like, I felt like I met my match with this one. Right. This was serious stuff. Wow, well, well, that's pretty Pretty strong language, given I know your your history and background. Um, now, did this compare or remind you of any other storm? And you said it was unique, but is anything close? The only one, um, the only one that it compares to is Super Typhoon Haiyan, which I uh, wrote out in Tacloban City in the Philippines. Now, Haiyan was also a Category Five and sort of similar to Patricia, like kind of small, very concentrated. Um, and so that that was, I would say, these two were roughly comparable for me. They both felt kind of the same. Um, Haiyan was different. Haiyan. Uh, directly hit a large population center. The core of Haiyan moved over a city of 220,000 people, Tacloban City, and it was an epic human tragedy right. with six to 10,000 deaths. Now, this is the kind of thing that could have happened had Patricia wobbled a little bit toward Monsonio or Puerto Vallarta, and right. then people would not have been saying it was hyped. Oh, of course. Now, just quickly here before the break, 10 seconds or so, as you're driving up and down the coast of your apartment, what are you using to sort of, what kind of, are you just using cell phone? Are you got any technology that you're using? An iPad with a network connection, and we have a couple of partners back home, including my right-hand man, Scott Brownfield, who actually help us. They, they analyze the uh, satellite loops for us, at, or, or they help us do that, so we talk together and make a decision. Okay, so yeah, so you've got a pretty self-contained operation, and it certainly takes that. And when we return, I want to get a little bit more into why Josh does what he does with this chasing, and the answer might surprise you, and I want to get some of his perspective. But first, let's hear about our Geek of the Week. This week's Geek of the Week is Andrew Hagen, a tropical meteorologist with Storm Geo. His interest in meteorology was sparked by a hurricane that bared his name. Let me think about this. Yes, Hurricane Andrew back in 1992. And he's not the only one in his family to have been through a major hurricane. His grandmother survived the Great Miami Hurricane of 26 when her older brother saved her life by pulling her out of the crib seconds before the ceiling collapsed. Andrew has also helped reanalyze past hurricane intensities benefiting the research community greatly. Congratulations to Andrew Hagen, our Geek of the Week. And we're back with Josh Morgan. He's a, a storm chaser, a, a hurricane chaser, really, and really the first that we've had on Weather Geeks. Now I want to get more into, you talked a little bit about why you do what you do, but Weather Geeks viewers, you might not know this, but this guy is a Harvard history grad. Is that right? And that is, yeah. Not a meteorologist. Right. So again, tell us how a history grad becomes one of the world's foremost hurricane chasers. Yeah, you know, I, I come from a liberal arts uh, education yeah. and, uh, and I had no uh, plan to go into anything scientific. And actually, you know, um, and that was actually the right choice for me because, uh, you know, chasing hurricanes for me initially, it wasn't about the science. It was about just, um, this adrenaline rush or something that I got from violent weather and specifically from hurricanes, like it just, just the, the awe inspired me. It was like a drug almost, you right, know, being right. in them. But over the years, actually, it, my motivations have evolved a little bit, you know. Um, one thing I noticed is that these intense cyclones are coming ashore oftentimes in the developing world or, sure. or places like the Philippines or even places like Mexico close to us. They're coming ashore with no weather stations, no recon, nothing recording how strong they are or anything. Right. And that drives me crazy. And I finally realized that as a chaser, I can fill in those gaps. And so collecting data in these storms coming ashore in remote places like Hurricane Patricia, sure. collecting that data actually gives me almost as much of an adrenaline rush as, as uh, as, as just the storm itself. You know, going in there and getting central pressure readings of historic storms and analyzing the data after, I'm really into that. Now, you know, that's I'm glad you mentioned that because there are some that would criticize the sort of thrill-seeking element or the adrenaline rush element of chasing, whether it be hurricanes or tornadoes. Uh, the host of a certain show on the Weather Channel might have written something every now and then on tornado chasing, but you say that there is 
uh, sort of a gap filling role. There's sort of a, a evolving scientific role that you see in this regard. And I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. So have you had any, how do you, well, let me ask you this first. How do you decide what storm to chase? I mean, we get storms throughout the year. What makes you say, oh, I gotta go chase that one? Well, that's a million dollar question because yeah. that, that's what sort of separates the men from the boys. And that's what separates a great season from a bad one, you mm -hmm. know? And I've gone after, you know, fortunately not too many, but I've gone after ones that, that ended up not being good chase so subjects. So you have had bust. I've had a couple, okay. just a couple. My batting average is very high and I think of it as a competitive sport and I've got a good batting average. This year I aced it. I had four uh, wins. But yeah, deciding which are going to be good chase subjects, which are going to be strong cyclones approaching coastline, you know, accessible coastlines at right angles, deciding which those are going to be, that is, I mean, that, that really is what makes a good chaser. Right. And it's hard. Now, you know, this is not cheap. How do you finance this or how do you do this? I mean, is it you just have a stash somewhere, your chase stash, or you got a sponsor? I mean, or is it just all the above or? Well, you know, it's, um, you know, we all decide, you know, what's important to sure. us in life and, and where, you know, what kinds of experiences make our lives complete. For sure. me, it's, it's witnessing the most intense uh, storms that nature has to throw at you. Um, but over the years, it has actually, uh, it's, it's come to pay for itself, which is nice. Sure. So, so now I can really even do it more aggressively and mm -hmm. go after more storms, which is really great because at the end of the day, for me, it is just about the experience and the documentation. Now, is there a limit to what you'll chase or is there a point when you're in a chase where you say, I'm calling this off, I gotta take care of myself first, or I mean, have you experienced that or thought about that? Well, it's, it's funny you ask because Hurricane Patricia was that upper limit. That was really that limit well, for you. It was, you know, think about it, at its peak intensity, it was the strongest tropical cyclone ever observed on Earth. Right. 200 miles offshore from our location, we were in this little Mexican fishing village. I mean, if that's not hardcore, I don't, I mean, there's there's no situation that's ever gonna be past that. So I felt like I was facing the ultimate situation and my curiosity about it slightly outweighed my... Uh... And we're gonna talk about your top five chases when we come back for the break. So hold that thought. I wanna get more from you next on Weather Geeks. And we are back with hurricane chaser Josh Morgan, and we're going to now walk through some of Josh's most memorable hurricane chases. And sort of number five on the list is Typhoon Dujuin. Uh, what was the deal with that one? I think we may even have some video. Why, why was that on your top five list? So yeah, Typhoon Dujuin hit Taiwan, and what was cool about that one, it was a category four on our scale, and I got right in the eye, and as the eye passed over me, I had this amazing view of the eye wall. Yeah, he was around, in the eye wall for this one, right? Around me, and it just looked amazing. I loved the, like, the structure of it. It was so, I don't know, it was just really inspiring to me. Now, uh, Hurricane Wilma, you were also in the eye wall. By the way, first of all, typhoons, remember, are just hurricanes in the Western Pacific, uh, for the viewers out there. You we were in Hurricane Wilma as well, 2005, and they, I, tell us about that. Yeah, well, Hurricane and, Wilma, the last great hurricane to hit the USA. Yeah. I was on the west coast in a small village called Everglades, or west coast of Florida in a small village called Everglades City. Mm -hmm. What I remember at th about that one was that it was very ferocious after the eye passed. The, the backside of the hurricane was much worse, and the storm surge rushing into the town and suddenly inundating it, and my chase partner and I having to make like a very quick escape. That will always stay in my memory. Now, Hurricane Odeal, 2014. Now, I, I don't recall this one. Tell us a little bit about that. Where was uh, this one? This was an incredible, a historic storm. So this hit the popular resort city of Cabo San Lucas dead on. Now, uh, Cabo yeah, San Lucas um, usually doesn't get intense hurricanes. They get a lot of hurricanes, but weak ones. This was a powerful, almost a Category 4, a high-end Category 3, ran the city head on. Uh, I was in a hotel that just started to blow apart in the winds, and uh, my cameraman and I, despite bleeding and, and, uh, and, and scratches, we just kept our cameras running, and we got some incredible footage of what happens inside a building when hurricane winds bleeding get Bleeding and scratch, were you cut by glass? Wow. Yeah, okay. flying glass. Flying glass, okay. Yeah, and no, we heard in the first segment, your number two on your list is Hurricane Patricia. Yeah. And you said that's kind of your upper limit. You were trying to finish a thought. That's your upper limit storm, you were saying, right? Yeah, that really tested me because, um, you know, my fear of it was only slightly outweighed by my curiosity about it. And the curiosity is what made me and my chase partner stand our ground and face it and ride it out. I'm glad we did because, you know, I collected some incredibly rare data in it. Um, just, uh, it, it was what, a, what kind of data? So the air pressure data. So you're um, getting, okay. So so it wasn't just the low air, the, the lowest pressure I recorded was 937.8 millibars, which was doesn't sound too low for an extremely severe hurricane, but what was unbelievable were the pressure gradients. Right. Up to 11 
millibars per nautical mile. That is so, that is an unbelievable change over a small distance. And what's interesting is the most violent winds, the ones that started to just rip the hotel apart, happened with that gradient. Now, Makes remember sense. pressure gradient is directly proportional to wind speed. So keep that in mind, Weather Geeks viewers. Now, your number one storm, Typhoon Haiyan. Super Typhoon Haiyan will always just be a, a sort of a special place in my mind. So this was a and here we see some video. A Category Five hurricane on our scale, sure. hitting a city of 220,000 people, a, a city that's on the tip of a peninsula and very low above sea level. The city was devastated by Category Five winds and a just a tremendous storm surge. The human impact was it, it was it was epic, and I it, it really um, I found it disturbing, but helping with the recovery, going back a couple of times afterward, doing research, helping fundraising, um, you know, doing things to help victims has really kind of helped me come full circle with this. It's been very therapeutic. This has been a human experience for me, not just a tropical cyclone experience. Now, you know, quickly, in about 10 or 15 seconds here, what are your thoughts on this notion that people would have responded differently if had, had it been warned as a tsunami and not a, and the people there apparently don't know as much about storm surge as they do tsunami? It's really sad. Thousands died because they didn't know what storm surge meant. Right. If, if they had heard that a tsunami was coming, they would have gotten out of the way. So there's an education thing there. Yeah, there's an education thing, and we've dealt with it on the show many times, just communicating the messaging. We knew it was coming, but sometimes subtle messaging can be the difference. Josh, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been fascinating. Uh, we look forward to having you again soon, perhaps next season after the hurricane uh, uh, season or the typhoon season, for that matter. Thank you. Now, Weather Geeks, thank you for joining us uh, on the show. Uh, you know we're here every week. You can find us on Twitter at WXGeeksTWC, and we'd love to hear your thoughts. And we also have our past shows on our website, and you can also find us on Facebook. See you next week on Weather Geeks.